and welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio. I am your host, Paul Markle, and I'm glad that you decided to join us this week for a brand new episode of Student of the Gun Radio. Now, we are back at our home studios. Thank goodness. We've been on the road for the last couple of weeks, and we're always glad to get out on the road, see our friends, spend some time with people. But, hey, you guys know how it is. It's always good to be home, and we are home. And today we are all geared up, that's right, we are all geared up to provide you guys with two full segments of Student of the Gun Radio, so hang on to your hats and let's get started. Now before we get started, we want to make sure that we thank our good friends at Caltech Weapons of Cocoa, Florida, and also, of course, our good friends at Crossbreed Holsters of Republic, Missouri. And if you guys have been listening to the show the last few weeks, uh, actually the last five weeks, You'll know that we uh, did a contest, a Super Tuck giveaway contest. Now, the contest is over, but that shouldn't stop you from going to studentofthegun.com and signing up for our newsletter. If you go to studentofthegun.com, sign up for the newsletter, you are automatically eligible for all of our contests and our giveaways. And let me tell you what, brothers and sisters, we give away some pretty cool stuff. Do we not, Jared? We do. We give away some pretty cool stuff. And, Jared, tell them... You go ahead and tell them while I sip my coffee what we're giving away next. Uh, we are going to be giving away the KSG um, next. And Kel- uh, Derek over there from Keltec is actually one of our good friends, and he didn't just want to give away a KSG. He also said that we needed five runner-ups, and they're all going to get the new CL- CL43 flashlight, which is ridiculously bright. So not only are you going, to, we have a grand prize. That's a KSG 12 shotgun, and uh, we have five runner-up prizes, which are going to be the Keltec CL43 lights. Th- those are the. If you've been over to their website or if you've been paying attention to uh, what's going on with them at Keltec, they got two lights. They have one that's kind of a standard version that looks like a normal flashlight, and it has a tail cap switch. And then they have the CL43, which has a grip switch, so you can actually hold the light in your support hand, grip it to turn the light on and off with your uh, middle finger while you're holding on to a pistol. It's really cool. It's really innovative and kind of neat design. And also, uh, we, we announced it last week, but we'll go ahead and bring you guys back up to speed if you didn't catch last week's episode. Uh, we've added something to our grand prize. Uh, we have a new sponsor at Student of the Gun, Student of the Gun TV, Student of the Gun uh, Our friends at Frog Lube. And Frog Lube has offered, uh, they make some really cool uh, gun care and maintenance products. And we're going to throw in, with the KSG giveaway, we're going to throw in the Frog Tube. That's a complete gun maintenance and cleaning kit. I think it's uh, like a $50 value. So that's just a value-added thing that we do for you guys. And all you have to do is go over to studentofthegun.com, sign up for our weekly newsletter, and... uh, that's it. As long as you're an active, active subscriber, you're eligible. Now we, we're hip to some of you, uh, some of you internet dudes that subscribe, then go back on 24 hours later and unsubscribe. Hey, if you do that, that's fantastic. And this is America, and you can do anything you want, but you're not going to win a KSG shotgun because only active subscribers are eligible. And uh, we actually met. We were talking to some people on the road this week. Uh, a lot of our fr- uh, fans of the show, and uh, one person said, "You know, I was really impressed." And we're like, well, by what? Well, you guys don't spam us. I just get the one newsletter each week, and I don't get anything else. We're like, well, yeah, that's what we told you. And we were serious. We don't sell your addresses. We don't spam you. We give you information about what is new, cool, and what's going on with our program. So it costs you nothing, and you could win lots of really cool stuff. Uh, We also want to uh, acknowledge our good friends over at the Firearms Radio Network. We've got a lot of good friends that host uh, some of the other shows that you'll find on Firearms Radio Network. We just talked to our uh, our good buddies over at Big and Wild Outdoors, Braden and Glenn, yesterday morning. We were actually, we were making our way back, (laughs) trying to make our way back from Ohio. We were on the road, on the highway, and uh, we called in and we talked to our buddies Braden and Glenn at Big and Wild Outdoors. And if you guys go over to their uh, this week's podcast, you can hear the little uh, interview and the chit-chat that we did on the way. And, of course, that was a live from the road interview. Now, uh, Jared, you guys don't know it, but Jared has been working his butt off. He doesn't just edit the radio show. He doesn't just edit the TV show. He's also been updating and expanding our social media. That's right. For all of you guys that are listening via your 
mobile device, whatever that happens to be, whether it's a phone or a pad or a laptop or whatever, Jared's been doing a lot of work updating the social media sites. And Jared, why don't you give them a quick what for about what what you're doing and what you've been working on as far as social media is concerned? He's right. I do a lot of things for Student of the Gun, and social media is one of them. I actually just updated our Instagram account. We've got Pinterest. Uh, what else do we have? We've got Facebook, Twitter, Twitter LinkedIn. Basically anything social media, uh, look for a student of the gun on there and follow us. And we do – sometimes we do giveaways just for social media. And like the Facebook, the student of the week, you can win a shirt just by going to our Facebook page and asking a question. And and, and don't forget if you go to studentofthegun.com up there in the upper right-hand corner – there's all the little icons, right, Jared? Correct. And actually, I'm not going to lie. I was just going there to look and make sure I covered everything. <laughs> so, yeah, whatever your favorite little icon is, whether it's the little F or the little birdie or the the I or the whatever, uh, if that's what you're into, if that's your cool social media thing uh, that you are into this week or this month and you want to follow Student of the Gun, you just click on it, follow us, and it'll it'll take you right there. So, uh, I don't know. How, and, you know, a lot of times, Jared, uh, Jared and I will be out on the road and we can't get to our laptops or our computers or what have you. And we might be doing something, you know, kind of cool, kind of interesting. And uh, so Jared will just he'll whip out his super smartphone there and he'll take pictures of whatever we happen to be doing. And he'll put it up like uh, Instagram or Facebook or what have you. And so that's where a lot of that material is generated. And if you want to take advantage of that material, go ahead and sign up for it. And at very least, if you take advantage of it, it lets Jared know that his effort is worthwhile. And uh, a couple new ones that I'm going to be working on shortly, um, Vimeo or Vimeo, I'm not sure how you say that, but I'm going to make a student of the gun Vimeo account as well as a Vine account. So if you guys want to watch some more videos, pay, pay attention to us on there as well. All right. Well, let's get into the meat of the segment. Let's talk about what we did that last week. And uh, fans of the show will know that we actually recorded a show from Jackson, Ohio at Canner's Cave 4-H Camp. Uh, they were just super gracious. And, and you know, we, we've known these folks up there for years, 13, 14 years. They're fantastic people. Uh, they let us spread our gear out everywhere. Uh, they let us pretty much take over the balcony area of the uh, main lodge and set up our TV production gear and our radio production gear. Well, we had a fantastic week, and what we wanted to do for you guys is kind of give you a, a summary or a wrap-up of some of the things that we did while we were at the shooting education camp. And, folks, if you've never been to a camp like this or you've never uh, experienced anything like it, let me take a moment to kind of explain what it's all about. Now, the 4-H shooting sports program nationally has been in existence since the 1990s, and it's been active uh, in the state of Ohio since around 1999, 98. And I first came, I first got involved with 4-H shooting sports in the year 2000. That's when I discovered the Ohio 4-H Shooting Education Camp. And this is a camp where they allow kids, and when I say kids, I mean uh, young people age you know, 11, 12, all the way up to 19, 4-H age. They let them come in, and for an entire week, these kids get to participate in the shooting sport discipline of their choice. Now, that could be archery, could be pistol shooting, shotgun, rifle, muzzle loading. They have a program called Living History. And the kids will spend an entire week not only shooting their favorite discipline, but also enjoying things like they have a what they call a shooting sports sampler. So if you're an archery kid and you've never shot a pistol or you've never shot a shotgun or a rifle, you can go over and you can try that out for the afternoon. It, it gives these kids the opportunity to spend you know, an entire week, a full five plus day, you know, five, it's like five and a half days when, by the time you come in and check out and so forth. But to spend that much, that time learning about the discipline, learning about archery, about shotgun and what have you, it's kind of a full immersion training program. And because it's a 4-H program, because it's run through the Ohio 4-H Extension Office, they keep it relatively inexpensive. I think you know for a couple of hundred dollars, maybe two fifty a week, your kid can go and spend five days at a camp 
where they will shoot. Jeez, Jared, if you took, take the shotgun program, how many shotgun shells, how many 20 gauge shells will you shoot in one shooting education camp? Um, I think they give you a whole brick of of ammo, actually. Which is, Would you say 500 rounds in a week? Yeah, is- depending on which one you take, um, the more advanced, obviously, shoot more. But, yeah, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 uh, shells. So let's say your your uh, your young you know, son or daughter is interested in shotgun and they go out there and uh, they could could you know shoot 500 rounds of of 20 gauge or 12 gauge and or 500 rounds of 22 pistol or what have you that's a lot of ammunition uh, they feed the kids they house the kids uh, they let them participate in the shooting sports they don't have to bring guns a lot of kids uh, will bring their own personally owned shotguns or rifles or pistols or bows or what have you, but they don't have to. Let's say if you have a, a, a young, uh, let's say you got a 10, 11 year old child, 12 year old child, and they're really interested in archery, but you don't own any archery gear. That's okay. Uh, you can sign your kids up for shooting education camp, take them down there, and they'll provide them with the arrows and the bows and the hand guards and the finger tabs and all the stuff they need to participate. This, this program, I, I cannot speak highly of it enough. I'm, I guess I'm a little bit selfish because I've been involved with the program, like I said, since the year 2000. And I knew when we started Student of the Gun Television, uh, what, two, three years ago, I knew as soon as we did that, that we were going to produce shows and let everyone in the United States make sure that people that were shooting people, that were gun people, that you're aware of this program. And, and it, it's <laughs> it's a little bit frustrating to me, quite frankly, because I will go out, uh, you know, we'll be on trips, we'll go to NRA or we'll go to SHOT or we'll go to, you know, different events. And a lot of times, uh, often when the the uh, youth shooting will come up or youth shooting education will come up, I'll mention the 4 shooting sports program. And I still... You know, all these years later, 13, 14 years later, we'll hear from people, oh, well, I didn't know 4-H had shooting sports. Yes, it, <laughs> 4-H shooting sports is kind of like, you know, it's like the Rodney Dangerfield of youth shooting education programs. That They get no respect. They really don't. But they should get respect because right now the uh, dedicated adult volunteers – of the shooting sports program, and they don't get paid. There are very few people that actually, uh, you know, do it full time as a job. There, are, there are a few state coordinators that work for the universities that actually that is their their main job. But most of the folks that are involved in the program just do it out of the goodness of their hearts. They volunteer their time, and when it comes to uh, you know a week long camp, you've got adults that that will deliberately use up a full week's vacation time. You know, seven, eight days so they can go down and, you know, set the camp up. Because, you know, when you're talking about an event that's going to host almost 200 kids plus adult volunteers and so forth, these events don't just set themselves up in an hour. I mean, most of the adults will get there a day or two ahead of time, go out and set up the ranges and the shelters, you know, the portable shelters and shade and traps and targets and all that stuff. They, and then, of course, they have to tear it all down at the end of the week, too. It's a lot of work, a lot of effort, and these folks, uh, I know they, they have a big program in Texas. I know Texas is really big into the shooting sports, into 4-H shooting sports. And forgive me if your state is, is big into it and I haven't mentioned you, but these folks are really doing a fantastic job, and they're ensuring that young people, that people of the, the next generation, the up-and-coming generation, have the opportunity to get involved in, you know, whatever it happens to be, whether it's a pistol program or a rifle program. Uh, you know, they do hunter's education through 4-H shooting sports, like I said, with the living history and so forth. And you should see some of these kids. These kids get out there. Let's face it. Kids have – most kids have good eyesight and good reflexes. And they get out there. And second and third year shotgun shooters, these kids are just out at the trap field, the skeet field, and they're crushing these clays. It's it's just fantastic to watch. But uh, And we have a lot of industry support. Now, I know I said that, you know, I, we go out and some people are like, hey, I never heard of it. But there are industry leaders who have heard of the shooting sports program, and they do support it. And while we were up at camp this week, we got to spend some time with our good friends uh, Tom Yost from Smith & Wesson and Ed Fitzgerald from Glock. 
And then the Scholastic Pistol Program was represented by Scott Moore and Tammy Mowry. And they came up and they put on the third annual Smith & Wesson Steel Pistol Challenge. And the kids got to participate. It's kind of like the Steel Challenge for adults. Uh, but the kids got to participate in a uh, uh, one evening in a shooting contest where they had to address steel plates with a pistol, with an M&P pistol, and then they had to go over and address steel plates with an M&P 22 rifle. And they uh, just uh, calculated their scores, and the top, cor- top score won. The kids had a great time. And like I said, uh, Tom and Ed and Tammy and Scott were out there and, you know, just kind of helping the kids with the courses and supporting them. And Smith & Wesson has been fantastic. Smith & Wesson has donated a tremendous amount of hardware to the camp and as well as monetary, uh, monetary support to them. So we want to acknowledge them. We had a good question. A question came up here recently. Someone said, well, when should I get my kids involved in the shooting sports? Or when is it safe for them to? Or, and, and as far as 4-H, the organized shooting sports are concerned, I believe, Jared, it's nine years old, right? Yeah, it's nine years old. Yeah. The cutoff is is nine. The kids have to be nine years old, 4-H age, uh, and that they start 4-H age as of January 1st. So it's kind of like, you know, if you're nine years old as of January 1st, then you can participate. But uh, – and there, and people said, well, that's not really fair. I've got a seven year old who's very mature for his age. And, and we understand that. And they understand that, yeah, you know, there's always the anomaly. But what they've done is they've actually researched it. And as far as the, the normal attention span for a child who's eight or a child who's nine or a child who's 10, it's going to be different. And, uh, as far as elementary education, they found that nine-year-olds do have a larger or greater attention span across the board than eight-year-olds. And that's really, when it comes to safe use of firearms, you got to make sure that the child has uh, enough attention span that, that you don't have to be one-on-one with the child all the time. Now, if it's you, I would teach my kids, and, and I did, you know, when I say I would, I did. I did that a long, long time ago. My kids are all big now. But... Uh, You can teach your kids, as soon as your kids are old enough to realize that fire is hot and shouldn't be played with, um, that the holes in the walls are called sockets, and if you put your finger or a a butter knife in it, it's going to shock you. Or keys, huh, Sir? (laughs) Yeah, keys will do that to you, too. It'll it'll biz you. Yeah, if you put your your papa's car key into the wall socket, it's going to biz you. Yeah. He's he's telling stories on me. <laughs> but if, if your children are mature enough, intelligent enough to understand that we don't play with the stove, we don't put keys in the wall socket, um, daddy's power tools are not toys and we don't play with them, then they're old enough to be taught that firearms are tools that you need to respect, that we don't play with them like toys that we need to respect them. It's just like, you know, uh, you know you've know, got a workbench at home, right? Or if you don't have a workbench, I'm sure you have a toolbox full of tools. Do you let your two-year-old take your hammer and just go play with it? I'm guessing no, because if you do that, you're going to be doing a lot of plastering around your house and sweeping up broken things. Of course you don't let your two-year-old play with a hammer. Well, you wouldn't let your two-year-old play with a pistol either. But can you teach your two- or three- or four-year-old that hammers are not toys and we don't play with them? Can you teach them not to play with fire or matches or mess with the stove? Of course you can. Why? Um you know, people say, oh, you should never have a gun in your home because it's too dangerous and your child might get a hold of it. You're like, well, you have fire in your home. You have sharp objects in your home. You have electricity and water in your home. All those things could kill your child if they were misused. But yet you still have them in your home, don't you? Yeah. Well, there you go. If you can teach a child not to play with the stove, you can teach a child not to play with a gun. But when it comes, and, you know, my kids, when they were, what, five, five, six years old, I guess, I got them a little Henry single shot 22, the little mini bolt 22 from Henry Firearms. And we went out there, and it was just the right size for them. And they fired one shot and one shot accurately. And then as they grew, you know, introduced them to new things. And, you know, the, the great thing about having three kids and one mini bolt rifle is when one outgrows it, you pass it down to the next one and the next one. And now, they're all too really too big for it, but maybe I'll give it to my grandkids someday. But I don't need any grandkids just yet, Jared. Okay, I'll remember that. I'll keep that in mind. Okay, we need to remind Jared that, that Paul does not need any grandkids yet. I can wait for grandkids. <laughs> now, uh, 
So, yeah, I mean, obviously you want to teach your kids, but as far as 4-H is concerned, uh, 4-H right now, the the shooting ed camps, they've gotten so big, they used to just take kids from ages 10 to 19, and and the 10-year-olds had to have their adults. Like, if you were an adult instructor, you could bring a 10-year-old, otherwise it was 11 or 12. But uh, the program has gotten so big that they actually had to start holding two camps. They actually they hold a junior camp now for kids 9, 10, and 11 years old, and then they hold a senior camp, and the senior camp is for kids 12 to 19. And uh, the senior camp is a week long, and the junior camp is, what, a weekend, Jared? It's like Friday through Sunday? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Uh, now, we had – oh, <laughs> before I get into it, I want to announce – and I feel ashamed that I didn't announce this earlier in the show, but, heck, let's go ahead and announce it now. Ladies and gentlemen, drum roll, please. Jared Markle was crowned this week the Intercontinental Combat Clay Shooting Champion. That's right. At the Shooting Education Camp Dateline, Jackson, Ohio, Jared Markle became the International Combat Clays Champion. You're like, I know you're thinking, how do, how do I do that? How do I become the Combat Clay Champion? Jared, tell them what they have to do to be a Combat Clays Champion. Well, if you think you have what it takes... You can challenge me with a KSG-12 with an EOTech optic on it. That's what I used anyway. Um, you can just use a regular KSG if you'd like and um, come up and shoot some clays with me and see if you can shoot more than me. <laughs> That's right. We were doing show and tell with the KSG-12 shotgun this week. And we had it out with our buddies uh, over at the Trap and Skeet Ranges. And, uh, and my buddy Fred, he said, he goes, well, all right, you got your shotgun there. Let's see what you can do with it. So we got up and uh, we started shooting some, and I'll have to admit to you, I wasn't I wasn't working the lead right. I was trying to shoot the KSG like you would shoot a fighting shotgun at a stationary target, and I, I broke a couple of clays. But I give it to Jared now. Jared, go, he's a shotgun shooter. Jared's done clays and skeet and five stand and sporting clays and all that good stuff. So we got Jared up on the trap field, and uh, after first couple of shots, he figured out how to address the lead with that little red aiming dot of an EOTech optic, and he was crushing them. Not only was he crushing them, then we got some of the kids up there, and Jared was teaching them how to use a KSG-12 fighting combat shotgun. That's right, a combat shotgun uh, to break clays off of the trap house. So we did that, and we're like, well, for more of a challenge, I think what we're going to do is we're going to go over to the uh, the sporting clays field. And our good buddies, Fred and Doug, uh, you, you guys, if you're listening, you know who you are, Fred, Doug, Jim, Mark, uh, Kevin, that's right. They set up a what we call, they call creative ballistic testing program where you had incoming clays. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. You had clays coming in from, uh, what, 30, 45 five degree angle. Uh, and if you didn't shoot them, if you didn't crush them, they could actually hit you, run into you. Uh, and this is just adults. This is not for the kids. This is for the, for the big boys. And uh, Jared got up on this range with his KSG 12 and the EOTech optic and was crushing incomers, just crushing them. So, uh, after it was all said and done at the end of the week, Jared was crowned the inter intercontinental, combat clays champion and if you think you've got what it takes if you think you've got what it takes to take a combat or a fighting shotgun and get out there and uh, take jared on uh we're we're actually we're we're vetting interest right now and uh, for a fighting shotgun or a tactical shotgun shooting event what do you guys think if you think that's a good idea if you have a fighting shotgun if you have a tactical shotgun no wood allowed no wood. It's got to be blue steel, got to be polymer. We're talking pistol grips. We're talking rails. We're talking foregrips. We're talking crazy combat shotgun shooting and busting orange clays in the air. If you think you've got what it takes, if you think you're up for the challenge, send us a note. Send us. Go over to Student of the Gun Facebook and let us know that you are up for the challenge. Uh, oh, what else do we do, Jared? Well, I mean, we did all kinds of stuff. And for those of you who uh, who aren't familiar with it yet or aren't aware of it yet, we are back on broadcast television. That's right. Student of the Gun is back on broadcast television. We're on the Dish Network, channel 266. 
And right now the show airs at 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Sunday night. So if you want to watch us, if you want to set your DVR, if you're a Dish Network subscriber, set your DVR to uh, channel 266 at 7 p.m. Eastern, and that's the Hunt Channel TV lineup. Now, if you're a Dish subscriber, you'll see that uh, it'll be listed as the Angel 2 programming or Angel 2 broadcasting. And the Hunt TV, uh, Hunt TV guys, they uh, they basically purchase time from them, and that's where we're at. Now, what we did all week long is we recorded material for the television show. And that's going to be coming up. Uh, you know, Jared is good, uh, but he's, he doesn't have enough time in the day to give it to you immediately. We're producing the material right now. He's cutting it and editing it. So pay close attention because in the next couple of months, you're going to see exactly what we did up there at Shooting Education Camp. And we did something special this year. We featured uh, material from Shooting Ed Camp before. You know, we've, we've kind of done the overview of the pistol program and the shotgun and rifle. But what we did this year is we decided what we were going to do is we were going to pick out three individual subjects, three adults in training, uh, Rebecca, Jacob, and Jessica. And uh, Rebecca was a little shotgun kid, and uh, Jacob was a rifle kid, and Jessica was a pistol kid. And what we did, we, we uh, interviewed them, we talked to their, their parents, we talked to their coaches, we followed them throughout their experience at the shooting education camp. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring their stories to you via the television program. So stay tuned for that. It should be a lot of fun. It should be very interesting. Uh, oh, <laughs> uh, at, at the end, a lot of these kids, you know, some of these these young people, you know, they start going to camp when they're 12 years old. And they go every year all the way up until they graduate from high school. And then they have their last camp. And they're too old to come back again. And and it's it's that end of an era you guys know what it's like. You you graduated from high school. You know what it's like when, you know, one era comes to an end and you have to move on to another era in your life. And some of these kids were really on the last day of camp, the last evening, when they do the candle ceremony and everyone did, kind of does the, you know, the goodbye hugs and what have you. And it was it was kind of a touching moment when we did capture some of that. Jared got it on film, and I think you guys will appreciate it. Those of you that have hearts and souls, uh, if you don't have a heart or a soul, then you won't appreciate it, and you can just move on with your life. <laughs> now, before we wrap up um, with our, our camp experience, we really want to take a moment to personally thank Larry and Anita Harris. They run Canner's Cave, and they run Larry runs the 4-H shooting sports program in Ohio. He's the coordinator. And Anita, his lovely wife, runs Canner's Cave Shooting uh, Camp. And they just, they, folks, they do a fantastic job. Not just at shooting education camp. They do it all year long. We want to thank them. We want to thank Fred Sherman, who's the president of the 4-H Shooting Sports Council in Ohio, and Tom Johnson, who is the state pistol coordinator, who just does yeoman's work organizing and working with people like Smith & Wesson and uh, the Scholastic Pistol Program and Glock and so forth. We want to thank them for just, you know, helping us out, giving us the material we needed, and just being good friends. And, oh, I, I want to remind you, I want to remind you guys how awesome you are. That's right. You guys out there in the audience and the student of the gun audience are fantastic. Uh, during a couple of shows here over the last well, previous couple months, uh, we mentioned how obviously 22 long rifle ammunition is tight. Regardless uh, whether you're getting it through Winchester or Federal or Remington or what have you, it's tight. And the 4-H shooting sports program has had a difficult time coming up with enough 22 long rifle. Not impossible, but difficult like everyone else coming up with enough 22 long rifle to let the kids shoot the pistols and the rifles and i asked you i went to this microphone here and i said hey if you're sitting on a stash you know if you've got 5000 rounds of 22 and you'd be willing to donate some of it to a youth shooting program that the 4H shooting program will put it to good use and when i got to camp this year i talked to larry and i talked to some of the other instructors and they told me that you guys, that uh, students of the gun, that the people who listen to this show had contacted them over the last couple of months and had made donations of several thousand rounds of twenty two long rifles so that these kids all week long could, you know, would have enough to shoot their pistols and their rifles. And we had almost 200 kids. It was like 170-some kids came out. Not all of them did pistol and rifle, but a lot of them did. And no child, no adult in training at camp was, you know, for want of 22 rifle ammo if they needed it. 
They didn't run out. They had enough to do the entire program. And I really want to just express my heartfelt. You guys know who you are out there. Uh, and if you if you did that, if you donated to a local club or to a state club, you know, state institution, what have you, I really appreciate it. And you guys did a fantastic job. And I wish I could shake each one of your hands, but just take the sound of my voice as as thanks uh, to you. And the you know the uh, the camp season now it's you know it's the end of July. It's going into August. Um, most of the kids are going to be going back to school in the next couple of weeks. You know, colleges are already getting ready to go back next week. And, you know, young kids, the elementaries and high school, they're going back towards the end of August, beginning of September. So camp season is pretty much it's, it's drawing down. It's drawing to a close. And if you run a camp like Canter's Cave, Canter's Cave is a fantastic facility. It's over 300 acres. It has shotgun fields, rifle and pistol ranges, has archery, you know, two, two three archery fields. It's a fantastic place. And But during camp, during camp season, it's, you know, all out. They're just going all out from the very first 4-H camp all the way through to August. They're going full out, and they don't really have time to do any kind of upgrades or, or major repairs. And if you you own a house, if you own a house or an apartment or you own a business, you know how that gets. Sometimes, you know, stairs need to be replaced. You know, porches need to be painted. Toilets need to be fixed. You know, things like that. And you know, during, when, when things are going, you just you, sometimes you don't have time to do it. So what they're moving into right now throughout the fall uh, and, and in, of course, into next spring as well, is the is the repair the repair and upgrade phase, and I was talking to Larry, and he said that uh, he's actually had some some local groups come down, and uh, they'll, they've done some volunteer work. They they'll like you know replace a set of stairs in front of one of the cabins, for instance, or uh, or you know there's there's a porch on you know on a on the lodge the porch needs to be replaced, and and I said well you know if if I talk to my audience, Larry, I'm sure a lot of you guys out there, you guys and gals, are thinking, you know what, Paul, I'm convinced and I believe that this program is valuable, that this is something that these young people need to have because they are adults in training. We're training them to be the next generation. And what they need, material stuff, you know, they need bunks to sleep in. They need cabins with, with roofs that don't have holes in them, you know. And, and I'm not trying to say that this place is dilapidated, but, you know, when you bring in hundreds of kids every single week, what do those hundreds of kids do? Running up and down the stairs and what have you. So you've always got that continuous maintenance. Now, if you out there in the sound of my voice, if you're a carpenter, if you're an electrician, if you're a plumber, if you're a painter, if you own a, uh, you know, you own a business, you're like, dude, I, I own a lumber yard or, or what have you. And I'd like to help, you know, I'd like to volunteer. I'd like to be involved in the 4-H shooting sports program, or I'd like to do something to help these young people every year. If that is you, then I want you to contact my good friend, Larry Harris. Uh, He's the Ohio 4-H state shooting sports coordinator, and he's down there at Canner's Cave. Go ahead and contact him. Jared's got his hand up, and he wants to tell me something. Jared, tell me. I'm going to give you his direct email address, and I'm going to post it on studentofthegunradio.com as well. Um, If you want to contact Larry, his email is harris, H-A-R-R-I-S, dot, 870 at osu.edu. Okay, that's Harris, H A R R I S dot 870, just like the shotgun, at what is that, osu.edu? Correct. All right, it's that easy. Uh, if you want to get a hold of Larry, say, hey, Larry, I heard about you on Student of the Gun Radio, and I've got a lumber company, I've got an electrical company, I'm a plumber, you know, what can I do? And just, you know, hey, it couldn't hurt, and, and if you want to volunteer your time, Lord knows they, they could use it because they are not-for-profit. The 4 a Shooting Sports Program is a not-for-profit organization. These guys don't turn a dime. All the adults that go down there, you know, they, uh, they volunteer their time, and they would appreciate your help. If you want to get involved, uh, we would highly encourage you to do so. So just check them out. And, and uh, oh, what's the uh, – the, oh, their website is Ohio – Number four H shooting sports.org, right? We'll put that up for you guys too. If you just want to check them out real quick, if you want to check out the, the shooting sports program, uh, you know how to work the Google machine, right? You're listening to me on some type of mobile device. I know you are. 
go to Google or Bing or whatever your favorite search engine is and type in 4-H shooting sports and bam, there it is. Yeah, the direct website address is ohio4hshootingsports.org. Okay, there we go. So uh, I I hope that I've inspired you. And remember, oh, if you want to see pictures, if you guys want to see pictures of the kids in action and and what we did, we posted a whole bunch of pictures um, on Sooner the Gun Facebook, and you can go over there and check them out. Now, Jared, what time is it, Jared? It's time for the Student of the Week, I believe. Yep, it's time for the Student of the Week. Jared, tell us who our Student of the Week is and what was their question. Our Student of the Week is Brad Johnson. He wants to know, how long should I have to wait to receive my concealed carry permit from the state? (laughs) Talk about loaded questions. Well, uh, a lot of you guys out there, a lot of you folks that are listening that have discovered our show are new gun owners or new concealed carry owners or people who've just recently taken the classes what have you filled out all the permits and you're anxious. You're like, man, man, when, when am I going to get my permit back? I, you know, I, put, I did everything I was supposed to. Well, the answer to that question is it depends. Now, where do you live? What state do you live in? Do you live in free America? Do you live in a slave state? Because there are three types of legal carry in the United States of America. There are shall issue. There are distress, discretionary. And then there's constitutional carry. Now, constitutional carry is obviously the easiest because what the state says is, okay, the Constitution guarantees you the right to keep and bear arms as a citizen. And unless you are a convicted felon or if you've done other things to disqualify you from the ownership of a firearm, then you can carry. If you can lawfully own a firearm, you can lawfully carry it, such as what you have in, I believe it is, uh, New Hampshire. And Arizona, Arizona probably being the the greatest example. That's constitutional carry. Now, shall issue is this. And uh, when they started doing concealed carry permits uh, 20, 30 years ago, when when the state legislators were putting them together, the, the intelligent guys in the legislature said, well, if we give politicians the option to say no, they always will. (laughs) They'll never say no to spending money. But they will say no to giving, you know, to uh, affirming your rights. It's just the way it is. And so what they wrote into the language of the law is the words shall issue, which means, you know, after the law has passed, doesn't matter who happens to be occupying the seat of government at that moment in time, shall issue means that as long as you have, you know, dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's and submitted all the forms and paid your fee, unless they can come up with what is called an affirmative reason to deny you, they shall issue you that permit. And those words are a big, big deal. Uh, There have been concealed carry permits uh, and gun permits and so forth for a long time in the United States of America. But the vast majority of them up until historically recently, let's say the last you know 25 years, have been what they call discretionary. Now, a discretionary permit is this. It means you, put, you, you do everything. You, know, you fill out your paperwork. You submit your fees. You go to classes, fingerprints, photographs, all that stuff. And you submit it all. And the discretionary part is they can tell you, hmm, no. And you have no recourse because the discretion is left up to some bureaucrat, whether it's a sheriff or another person. A lot of times they dump it off on the sheriff because I think the legislator's like, well, dude, I don't want to touch this hot potato. Let's just throw it into the sheriff's lap. He's got he's got nothing to do. Let's make him do it. And so they make the sheriff the bad guy or they give him that authority, depending on how you look at it. But in a discretionary state. You have to prove to the state that you need that permit. And therein, that's the rub, ladies and gentlemen. That is the rub. I've had people tell me, oh, I went for my concealed carry permit interview. And I said, what? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, to get your permit, you have to do all the paperwork, and you have to submit the fees and your fingerprints and your pictures, and they do a background check on you. And the last thing they do is they bring you in and sit you down and interview you. I said, who interviews you? Well, somebody from the state. Okay, and? Well, then after the interview, they decide whether or not they're going to allow you to have it. 
Hmm. Let's think about that for a second. So a person who does not know you, a bureaucrat, a government worker, is going to sit down with you and interview you and just determine whether or not he thinks you have the right to carry a firearm, to bear arms. Now, remember, keep and bear is two parts. Keep is I can have it in my home. I have it in the safe. Bear arms means to carry it. It means to hold it in your hands. It means to have it on your person. It means to have control of it. If you live in a state where you have to lock your guns up in a safe and you're not allowed to move about with them under your control, you are not bearing arms. You're just keeping them, I guess, for safekeeping for later. If you live in an area where you have to sit down with a bureaucrat and have an interview with them, and they'll tell you whether or not they think you should be allowed to exercise your rights, that is a discretionary. And that's de facto, it's, it's a de facto slave state. Because let's face it, how many of you were children? Oh, that's right. All of you were children at one point in time. And when you live in your mom and dad's house, you are under discretionary ruling. You don't have the right to take the car. You don't have the right to stay out all night. You don't have the right to anything. You have to seek permission, and you will be told whether or not you can stay out late at night, whether you can take the car, what have you. And that is the same situation you find yourself in in a discretionary state. Now, in a shall-issue state, the intelligent ones will write into the shall-issue law. They'll put in there an actual time frame, such as, 90 days, 60 days, what have you. Now, normally bureaucrats, they, they, they give themselves a pretty healthy amount of time. Uh, I believe in Ohio, when I got my permit up there, that it was 90 days. And 90 seems to be pretty standard, but it could be 60 where you live. But in a shall issue state, it'll say that, you know, as long as you have done your part, that the state shall issue you your permit within, let's say, 60 days or or a letter explaining to you in detail why it has been denied. And that is the rub. In a shall-issue state, they can't just say, no, we don't think you need it. Bye. They have to give you an affirmative reason, and the vast majority of states that have shall-issue, they're smart enough to write in a time frame. Now, if you applied for your permit, right, and the state law, the statute says, shall issue within 90 days. And tick tock, tick tock, 90 days go by. You don't have your permit and you don't have a letter saying you have been denied your permit because whatever. We discovered you're a convicted felon or you're adjudicated to be mentally incompetent or what have you. If you don't get that, you're like, well, where, do, where am I at then? Then you need to go to the Google machine You need to, go, or a phone book. Do we still have phone books in America? I guess, I don't know. Do you have a phone book, Jared? I don't have a phone book. Well, it used to be in the old days you'd go to the phone book and, and you'd go to the government section and find out who uh, the contact information. If I'll, give you, I'll tell you what I would do. If I was in state X, I was in uh, Indiana or Ohio or Florida or whatever, I put my permit application in. It says, shall issue within 90 days. It's been 95 days. I still don't have it. I still don't have a letter telling me. I would try and contact the depart whichever department it is. And depending on your state, it's going to be different. Contact them directly. If you do not get satisfaction from them, go directly to your state representative. Because that's why they're there. They're there to represent you to the government. If the government is jerking you around... You go to your representative. That's the whole cool thing about the English language is it means things. Uh, they're not just there to spend tax money. They're supposed to be there to represent you, to represent your interest as a citizen. Uh, and what I would definitely do, though, is I would log it. I would uh, write down the times and dates. I would do something like that so that, that you can come back and say, look, I don't have it yet. It's supposed to, within 90 days, you're supposed to issue it to me. And if the state is not getting it done, well, it's the state's responsibility. They're like, oh, we don't have enough personnel to process it. You had enough personnel to cash my check and put it in your bank. Did you not? 
Don't don't let them off the hook that easy. They'll you know it's kind of like when you apply if you've ever applied for a, a class three item such as a suppressor or a short barrel rifle or something like that. Yeah, they cash your check immediately. It might be six months until you actually get your tax stamp back, but the the check cash is pretty quick. They they don't they're not slow about that. So if they've cashed your check and taken your money. It is their responsibility to give you an affirmative answer, yes or no. And if they tell you no, they need to explain to you why. That is the good news if you live in a shall-issue state. If you live in a discretionary state, guess what? It's this little thing we call Tango Sierra. That's right, Tango Sierra to you because you live in a communist state. You live in a state that thinks that you are not a citizen, that you are a servant. So, And that is up to you. If you want to live in one of those states, rock on. You can do that because as an American, you can be a voluntary slave. You can voluntarily be a slave to the state. If you don't want to do that, then move. All right. Now, that's going to bring us uh, – you know, I know we kind of shortchanged you guys a little bit, and I think you were bummed out that uh, we, expand, we expanded the show, and then we went on the road. And we were really – well, let me tell you, we we're we, – Jared, do we have enough to- hours in the day? Uh, definitely not. <laughs> Jared is lobbying for a 28-hour day so he can get more work done. But uh, now that we are back in our home studio, we are going to go back to our expanded format, and we're going to give you two full segments. So coming up in the next segment, you want to stick with us because we're going to talk about our ballistic testing excursion. That's right. We're out in Wyoming, and we want to tell you all about that. So stick with us, and we will be back in episode two. Episode two. 